Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ink Gamers podcast. Uh, my name is Peter Parrish, and I am here with Paul Junger, who is in his new studio. <laughs> Hello. How how is it, Paul? In the uh, you're, like, you're in a little booth there. I'm I'm feeling very comfortable. Very comfortable. It's nice and warm in here too. Lovely. Lovely. Broadcasting from your high tech pod. Yeah, uh, orbiting above the Earth. Indeed, it's a satellite. Awesome. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, Tim McDonald is here too. Tim, you're not in a special pod orbiting the Earth, but never mind. Neither am no, I. But I'm. I'm also not in a child's bedroom. I've got two <laughs> things to say. Firstly, okay. Paul, you're you're such a sellout. I mean, I'm just looking at all those things. Have you been paid off by all these developers and publishers? All of them have paid me off. Oh, I am, gee. I'm making millions just on payoffs alone. And and secondly, are we actually recording this time? <laughs> and we are actually recording this time. <laughs> Excellent! <laughs> Hooray! I'll try not to fuck up then. Um, yeah, well, all of this. Uh... <laughs> That doesn't count. We're allowed to swear. This uh, all this um, advertising revenue uh, does that guarantee that we're going to give out standing reviews to uh, Half Life, the original look, tribes? Look, look yeah, X-Wing I mean, versus Tie Fighter. Yeah, I know <laughs> games from like fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah, they're they're definitely hot on the old money for those ones. The, the point is, though, they are all really good games, or at least that's what we're going to say. The problem is, if we now say that they're really good, if I say, for instance, <laughs> Half Life is one of the best. Uh, first-person shooters to have come out uh, ever, and uh, it's, it's had a great you. impact on the gaming industry. Nobody will fucking believe me, because it's on a poster behind him. <laughs> what are you trying to say, <laughs> Tim? Um, I don't know, I'm just complaining that I'm not getting any money. Okay. No, basically, no, no one can trust us ever again. Uh, so, speaking of things that... No, well, we'll do Aliens Colonial Marines later. Speaking of things <laughs> you can't be trusted. Um... Never mind. Uh, we'll, we'll do news. News first. Uh, I still haven't decided which order we're going to do news in. But since we were talking about older games, let's uh, celebrate the fact that System Shock 2 is back from, um, uh, I don't know, trademark, copyright hell, and available uh, through uh, GOG, which is uh, great news because System Shock 2 is an excellent game. And in this week where there's been a couple of uh, slightly more ropey and much more ropey space-based uh, horror-type games <laughs> released. It's good that uh, people can play a really, really good one if they want to. Um, uh, Tim, I know you want to uh, express joy at System Shock 2 in general, probably. Um, <laughs> yeah, System Shock 2 is fucking great, uh, and thankfully it, it doesn't have a poster. We don't have a poster of Shodan behind Paul, so I can say this <laughs> without looking like a filthy sellout. Um, it's just a really, really good game. It's got so many little systems that work together so very, very well, and it's actually genuinely scary. Um, there's a, a, a little anecdote that one of my friends loves to tell. So he was playing System Shock 2 for the first time, and this was probably about five or six years ago. Um, and uh, he was stuck on one bit, and he was quite scared, and he asked me to come over and help him out with this bit, and I did. Uh, and uh, I was saying, oh, it's not that scary. I'd forgotten about the respawning enemies. Uh, I walked around a corner and something <laughs> was right there, and I jumped about a foot. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's it's a great game. You should all buy it. Peter, have you got any enduring memories of it? Uh, yeah, I didn't play it like when it originally came out. I played it uh, after the fact, possibly around the same time that uh, your friend did there in that anecdote. It was sort of four years ago, something like that. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, Really? It holds up amazingly well. Uh, it's got amazing sound design. It's got not like cutting edge graphics, but it has very uh, solid art direction. Uh, it uses the, the dark engine like a lot of Looking Glass Studio games did, and I think most of them have, have held up pretty well. The, the sort of characters themselves are a little bit ropey looking, but the environments are all really good still. Um, and yeah, it shows that you can do an amazing horror game without. Uh, amazing graphics necessarily. Uh, I think a lot of it is, is in the sound and uh, the uh, sort of situations and pressure it puts you under with kind of scarcity of equipment and uh, yeah the respawning enemies as you mentioned which are kind of annoying in some ways but also pretty integral to the design. Um, well, I, yeah. well, I know that uh, actually before I go on to that did, did you play System Shock 2 before or after the original Deus Ex then? Because the two are kind of 
I think the system oh. shock two flowed into Deus Ex in some ways in terms of the uh, the kind of combination between RPG and first person shooter, and a few of the systems kind of seem similar. Which, which did you yeah, play first? I, I played Deus Ex first, but I had such a terrible computer at the time that I had to play it in like software mode with massive loading times, and it was a bit of a chore. But I did play Deus Ex first. Um, so I was, yeah, it was pretty easy slotting into System Shock 2's way of doing things because it was pretty similar. And in some ways, I'm going to bring in Paul on this. I'm going to see if he's played System Shock 2 recently, ever. No. No. <laughs> no. I, don't, I don't even remember it playing it the first time round. I'm pretty sure I did, but I really okay. don't remember playing it, which just must have left such a massive impression on me at the time. <laughs> but um, I can't I can't actually remember it. I remember playing System Shock though. Thinking, ooh, that oh, was amazing. One. Yeah. I, I haven't how, how's the first I haven't played the first one. How uh, how is that? <laughs> Well, considering I can't remember System Shock 2, I'm not going to remember System Shock 1. I just do know that. Well, I, remember, I remember playing it. The, the first one's quite a good game, except that it's got one of the worst interfaces I've ever seen. Um, that This was kind of before the great UI revolution, where user interfaces suddenly became of great importance to people. Um, it's also got... I think there's a site on the internet that worked out that the protagonist has to have arms that are about nine feet long that and have no bones. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's it's not a bad game, but I, I do prefer the second, and I think the second is a bit easier to get into. I was I was going to make the point actually. Um, you mentioned before that graphics aren't integral to great horror, and I do think that System Shock Two is kind of one of the quintessential survival horror games, along with the first Resident Evil. Uh, and possibly the first Alone in the Dark as well, although that was quite a big fan of killing you off with absolutely no warning. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I think of the games that I do find really, really scary, many of them don't actually have wonderful graphics. Um, uh, whether I'm looking at kind of the earlier stuff like the original Clock Tower or the Fatal Frame Project Zero games, which are kind of the two top things on my list in terms of scaring the shit out of me. Um, or even some of the stuff like, um, I can't remember what it was called, was it Monster Mall, something like that, where you were a child in a mall after dark and there was a monster chasing you around and you had a very narrow view and you had to keep hiding from it as you were trying to sort of find your way out, um, which was vaguely terrifying and it was just top-down sprites. It's it's rarely with horror a case of what you show. It tends to be more what you don't show, which is I think why graphics aren't necessarily so important. Anyway, we basically everyone should buy System Shock Two. I think is essentially what we're saying, and we haven't even been paid to say that. <laughs> which no. is good. Um, so let's actually talk about something a bit more modern now. I suppose if we must. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz around uh, Bungie's new announcement, um, a game called Destiny, uh, which may or may not be of interest to us ultimately because we're not sure at this stage whether it will be on PC. They haven't announced, they've kind of made some mixed announcements about the PC. They've said we'd love to do it on the PC, which is good, but someone else from Bungie has also said something like, oh well, nobody really plays first person shooters on PC anymore, or words to that effect, which is a bit weird. Um, yeah, quite. Uh, Paul, I'll start with you. I know you're you're excited about Destiny. In fact, we're all excited about Destiny, oh, aren't we? I'm so excited about Destiny. I was more excited about the most ridiculous comments I've read this week from Bungie about how everyone uses controllers and nobody uses a keyboard and mouse. Are they... What, mm. what, sorry, but what fucking planet are they on? I mean, seriously, Tim knows that I'm going to go irate at this. <laughs> <laughs> because how... It's, it's just... It's the ultimate control system for shooters compared to a bloody thing. Oh, I don't know, Tim's going to disagree, I know he is. But um, yeah, that, that was a load of hogwash. No. Um, I, I think it was a lot of rubbish, and it was disappointing actually to see that. Um, you just have to look mm. at, you know, the, the amount of FPS games that are played by PC gamers, and I don't mean COD, you know, because everybody plays COD and everyone on the console plays COD, but um, yeah, there's just no comparison as far as I'm concerned. I've been playing FPS games for the last 20 God knows how many years now um, and it's keyboard and mouse all the way, so talking shit. It'd be nice though to see it actually come out on um, the PC 
Um, the always on connection thing was quite interesting. So that will fit perfectly into the PC market with an always on connection. It can join the likes of SimCity and Diablo 3. Um, but I don't think the console community is going to be uh, particularly like that. But I under sort of understand maybe we don't really know much about the game because the, the sort of preview event that they held as with most preview events told you absolutely nothing um so yeah it's all a little bit up in there nice to see it on pc don't expect it to see it on pc at launch to be honest um but it's bungie so we'll see what happens Tim, you're pretty sure it's coming to pc aren't you I am. I was just going to say, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with Paul in that I do think mouse and keyboard is the finest way to play first-person shooters. Um, it just causes difficulty because the response time is better with that, which generally means PC versions need to be tweaked a bit. Um, because you, you have greater sensitivity, you can aim faster, and uh, you don't really have auto-aim. Yeah, I, I can't see it not coming to PC. Um, I don't know whether it will be there at launch, but I'd be very surprised if it doesn't. Um, I mean, it's it's being published by Activision, who throw literally everything onto the PC. Um, I'd be very surprised if, if they missed out the opportunity to stick this on Steam somewhere. Um, and yeah, I mean, even, even the comments from within Bungie, they have been saying that they have it running on PCs and so on and so forth. So there's clearly some interest there. Um, what, what, I don't, what, what I don't get is, obviously they're... Obviously, they are testing it on PC, as they've already said. So why not just say it's coming to PC? Is it just to piss PC gamers off, or is it just to sell more next-gen consoles? Is that is that the plan? Well, it's on current-gen consoles as well, if I remember rightly. Um, I I don't know, honestly. I mean, it's it's getting weird with regards to PC releases being announced. I mean, we still don't know whether GTA V is coming to PC. And quite often, PC versions do seem to be getting announced a month or two after everything else. Um, like I said, I'd be very surprised if it doesn't come to PC, but maybe there's still something up in the air contractually. Maybe uh, when they announce it, they, they want to sort out shit like Steamworks, first of all. I don't know. Peter, are you excited <laughs> about Destiny? The uh, game. I'm more excited. Not, not your <laughs> Destiny, specifically. <laughs> I'm more excited about Destiny's Child. The... Uh... <laughs> Pop super group. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a reference nobody's going to care about. Actually, just just when we're on the subject, I don't know if you saw if you saw um, some of the screenshots that came out um, the other day. But was it me or did the weapons just not look like they're straight out of Halo? Um, I did. I did see quite a few like looks like Halo comments. I mean. I, I can see some similarities, but uh, the weapons I'm not so sure about. The the characters look pretty different, at least. Um, you, you do have to wonder, though, whether they're just recycling the same shit. On on the plus side, this is a game from Activision that doesn't look like Call of Duty. I mean, you've, yeah. you've got to be happy about that one, at least. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, going back to the... <laughs> Sorry, it's just too early to say whether I'm excited about it because they've literally shown very little from it other than here's kind of the character you might be playing as and here's sort of vaguely the kind of game we're trying to make. But uh, I don't know, beyond I'm, that, it's, it's, it's too early. I'm really staggered by the way they keep saying this is revolutionising the FPS and it doesn't fit into genres because it sounds like Borderlands um, in terms of being a... a kind of first-person shooter RPG hybrid with kind of co-op elements. Um, I mean, certainly it's it's always connected and you will bump into people in other areas, so it's MMO Borderlands or Tabula Rasa or various other MMO first-person shooters oh, that came Tim, you uttered that word. <laughs> Am I wrong? <laughs> well, no, but I don't know. <laughs> Tabula Rasa, the, the no. game that was so good that Richard Garriott had to go into space to escape it. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember it anyway. I don't know, I, I, I don't see it as being revolutionary. It might be something that's very, very new for consoles. Um, and it, it certainly does sound like it's kind of a combination of other ideas that hasn't necessarily been done in quite this way before. I do think they're possibly a little inaccurate in that they think that absolutely everything is better than, oh, sorry, better with other people. Um, because I quite like single player games on, on the internet. I find that other people are arseholes. Um, 
<laughs> Only on the internet, Tim. Um, <laughs> mostly on the internet. Mostly. They mostly come out on the internet. Mostly. mostly. Um, yeah, it's. I, I just really want to talk about aliens, guys. Um, Hang on. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, wait. Super. Let's. Peter, you just rattle through the news, and we'll let you get to the little bit, and you can have a little extended <laughs> segment on that. But all right. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, what, Good, okay. What else is up then? Uh, Gas Powered Games, who were doing their Wildman Kickstarter until they stopped doing their Wildman Kickstarter, got bought by uh, Wargaming, uh, the uh, Russian based studio who make um, World of Tanks and World of Warplanes and maybe other stuff as well that I'm not aware of. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of strange. We, we don't know any details behind this other than that it's a deal that happened. There's, there's no kind of uh, monetary value being banded around. We don't know what Gas Powered will be doing for Wargaming. Um, I, so, I, did, uh, um, I did actually try and contact them on the day when it came in and they're just not um, making any statement. But interestingly enough, um, Wargaming have just launched their eSports initiative for World of um, Tanks. So it kind of makes you wonder, are they going to get Gas Power Games to create some sort of strategy game that might be useful in a sort of eSports arena? Um, now, if I'm not mistaken, I think Wargaming themselves were pretty much um, strategy orientated before they started on the World of, World of Tanks route. So um, mm. it, it might actually be quite a good fit, and actually it's just good to see, um, you know, uh, Chris Taylor get through the the rough time. And it sounds like they probably shoved a whole lot of cash under his nose, and he said, "Yeah, why not?" It, sounds good to me. It seems like the only sane move, really. It didn't look like Wild Man was actually going to hit its funding goals. Um, so I'm kind of happy to see that Gas Powered Games is still running. I'm curious as to whether this means that Wild Man will be made or whether they'll go back to was it Kings and Castles was the thing they were working on before no, see, or, I'm, I'm, or whether Wargaming will make them do something entirely different I, I think too, I think they're going to get them to do something um, new and I think this I think the way that Wargaming are, are sort of positioning themselves in the esports I, I just wouldn't be surprised if we see something that would fit that um, if you have to look at stuff like um, um, League of Legends and Hon and StarCraft 2, I mean, they're just huge. And I just so, think Wargaming may have an eye on that. So so you're you're hedging your bets on World of Supreme Commander, then? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, don't, I, don't, I doubt that's going to happen. But uh, I don't know. I just I just got a gut feeling that, that may, something like that may happen. To tie this in with the uh, the destiny, everything is better with other people type stuff. I, I've I've got a bit of a nightmare vision of the future where every game is sort of a free to play esports focused arena thing that's broadcast over Twitch TV, and that's probably when I'm going to retire from this job. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've just got a nightmare vision of the future where developers and publishers are just going to keep pushing towards multiplayer and single player games or become a thing of the past. I don't think it'll actually happen. Um, but it, it does keep me up at night sometimes, nonetheless. I'm hoping that the PC's got enough of a thriving indie scene to uh, keep keep niche stuff, if it were to become a niche thing, to make single player, to, to keep that alive. I, I think you can thank oh. Kickstarter and Indiegogo and things like that. I think that's going to really help um, keep the PC alive, and I think it's doing a very good job at it at the moment. I think yeah, I mentioned... Yeah. Uh, I, I think I mentioned this particular... Um, fact before I'm trying to think of another word for fact but never mind um, but with regards to how everything's better with multiplayer I do remember something I think it was the original Unreal Tournament where uh, Epic Games came out and said that they discovered that something like 70% of the players who bought it never actually went online and played it multiplayer which was why they spent so much time focusing on building up the AI afterwards um, for the sequels and I kind of think that's true. Much as multiplayer is a big thing and it keeps people playing long after, I do think there are quite a lot of people who never go online yeah. uh, and do just prefer to play single player games. I, I think that developers who think that everything is better with other people and that what people want is more multiplayer games, I, I think they're mistaken, honestly. Uh, well, this is a good opportunity to uh, bring, bring in the final news piece that we were going to discuss, which was the... Uh, Thing about Tribes Ascend, the free-to-play Tribes Ascend, not the tribes that Paul has got behind him. It's a different tribes um, made by Hi-Rez. Um, 
where uh, yeah, it was a free to play game when it launched uh, last April, I think. Um, microtransactions all the way, etc. Um, and they are releasing a kind of game of the year edition where you can basically pay thirty dollars, I think, or twenty dollars if you're a VIP player, which probably means you've bought some stuff previously or something, um, to unlock uh, basically everything. Um, so rather than doing it piecemeal and spending probably an awful lot of money or, or grinding for it, you uh, just have to pay a lump sum up front and, uh, and you get everything, which uh, is an idea that you claim to have invented, Tim. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that true? <coughs> I don't think that's quite I don't, true. But. I, I don't think I'd, I'd necessarily lay claim to inventing it. Um, but it is something that I would like to see more free-to-play games do. If a free-to-play game actually has a good base, if it is a good game, then I would much rather shell out 30 quid and unlock everything um, and sit there grinding to unlock some things and occasionally paying microtransactions, but that's because I don't really like microtransactions in the first place. If you've got a really good game, like, for instance, Tribes Ascend, then I'd be much happier just paying 30 quid and getting everything and essentially having a new Tribes game to play whenever I want, however I want, then I would be playing it for free and messing around with it a bit and then paying a few quid to unlock a class and grinding and unlocking another. I mean, that's that's the sort of gamer I am, though. I, I kind of prefer to pay my money up front uh, rather than continually pay smaller fees. But I don't know. I mean, I think I mentioned this when we were talking about um, uh, Space Ninjas versus Aliens. Um, that's the one. Don't mention, don't, don't mention <laughs> aliens. You'll get, you'll get aliens. started. We'll get to aliens soon. Um. Okay, okay, just so, so quickly then. Yeah, Tim invented it. Um, you can buy it all now. You don't have to level up. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> That's um, Tribes of Sand, super duper, super duper edition. All right, Peter, off you go. Aliens, Colonial Marines. I know you've been ganging for this. Oh, aliens, Colonial Marines. Okay. Um, so, Good. yeah. The, yeah, it's amazing, Tim. It's an amazing game. Um, the, the reviews are on the site. <laughs> what? Am I lying? Yes, yeah, I'm lying. Uh, reviews on the site for Colonial Marines, Aliens, goodness. Um, it's, Matt, you know, there's so much almost to talk about in, in regards to this game just because of the curious development process that it seems to have undergone. Um, I mean, uh, Blimey, where where to even where to even begin? There's a lot of people coming out of the woodwork to say things like, um, in fact, it wasn't Gearbox that really developed it. It was actually TimeGate, a different studio whose name is in in the credits. Uh, other people, people have come out allegedly. Other people who allegedly work for TimeGate have come out and said, no, actually, Gearbox did plenty. Um, just don't blame us. It's not our fault. There's a lot of damage control going on, basically, with people trying to go, no, it was Sega's. No, no, it was Gearbox's fault. No, no, it was, it was TimeGate's. It was whatever. But someone was to blame for giving the OK to a gameplay demo that was shown at E3 and PAX and various other places, which bears... I don't want to say no resemblance to the final game because there are, there are some resemblances. It's got Alien in it, for example. But um, in terms of graphics, no resemblance really. In terms of the sort of set pieces that they're showing in that, pretty much none of them are in the final game. There's a couple that are in in a very sort of neutered, reduced form. Um, there's a bit like uh, the Alien, a big a big alien with a massive solid head that charges around that you called the Crusher, which in the gameplay demo is, is shown to be a fairly exciting sequence with it kind of like chasing you through um, the, the sort of uh, a bit of Hadley's Hope, I think it is. Um, in the actual game, all it is is the, the alien sort of pops out of the ground um, and does that thing that bosses do where they like charge at you and you have to sidestep them and, and shoot them in the back and then they charge at you again and you have to sidestep them and shoot them in the back. And it's a somewhat less exciting sequence, let me tell you. Um, so, but to be honest, I mean, even even if it did have the graphics that were shown in that gameplay demo, that would not save it because it's a game that doesn't. For all that Gearbox and Randy Pitchford kept saying they're massive Alien and Aliens fans, I kind of wonder whether they missed the, some of the point of the films because it. It's not a game that really uses its license very well because um, 
Well, let me let me ask uh, either of you guys. Who who do you think was the star of the original Alien film? Oh, it, it's got to be um, um, little girl little. Newt. Okay, you're going for Newt, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> who do you reckon was the star What's of Alien? What's that other film? <laughs> Uh, who who do I think was the star of the original Alien? Yeah, who do you think? Who do you think's the most important and integral? Uh, there's a few different answers. There's no like correct. The but, Alien, but, perhaps. I mean, it's, it's yes, got its name, I, I, and title, and everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would either go for the Alien or I'd go for Ripley, uh, yeah. who, who is the boss, a alien, and not a fucking colonial marine. <laughs> who? In both Alien and Aliens, are shown to be pretty much useless in the face of fighting aliens. You might notice that they die pretty much all the time in those films. Um, and in the first film, there's only one alien, all right? And this alien is really dangerous. It's really deadly. It's like the most advanced, structurally perfect predator in the galaxy. Um, <laughs> in Aliens, there's a, there's a few more of them. Can't <laughs> tell go on. I'm mid rant the, the al- please. The- the, the alien in the first film is terrifying and lethal unless you watch the deleted scene in which it crab walks along the floor on its arms, <laughs> at which point it becomes a lot less scary. <laughs> That's the kind of footage that would have fit in very well with Aliens Colonial <laughs> Marines because, uh, yeah, this, this world's deadliest killer is now just basically mindless cannon fodder in an FPS, which... Uh, it's pretty much at odds with all the dialogue stuff that's going on around you. You know, you've got your marine squad mates going like, "Oh man, this is such a terrible situation." Oh god, there's there's so many xenomorphs coming at you. And it's like, well, who cares? I've killed like fifty of them in the last level. It was really easy. I'm <laughs> just not bothered by that. You've reduced them to just this uh, average FPS enemy that either runs straight at me or climbs up the wall a bit and then gets a bit confused by the level geometry and. Uh, looks at me hopelessly as I shoot it in the head with a shotgun. Um, I mean, as, as, Paul. As, as, far, as far as I'd be concerned, the game should be, you know, fucking hard. You know, you should be dying mm. all the time. Because like you say, you, you're, you're, so, you're supposed to feel vulnerable. You're not, supposed, yeah. you're not supposed to be going guns blazing and knocking out 50. It should be damn hard and you should be dying a lot. So, yeah, and basically whenever you encounter an alien it should be a big deal, you know, it should be okay. Not, yeah, not necessarily that it's going to kill you constantly or whatever, because that might get kind of annoying, <laughs> but unless it's fair. Um, but, yeah, just that uh, th- there's no sort of urgency, you know, in, in Alien and Aliens, I, I think it, it, it's a, they're films that rely a lot on a lot of tension followed by bursts of kind of urgency and action, um, and there's just none of that kind of atmosphere or, or pacing in this game whatsoever, really. And also, half the time, you're not fighting aliens. You're fighting uh, Wayland yutani private military mercs or whatever. And it kind of becomes a bit of a cover shooter without any cover mechanics because um, you, have to, you have to use the cover that's around the place, otherwise they kill you pretty quickly. Um, and they're, they're as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than the aliens, really. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the, uh, the the little animated sequence that's been going on the internet of the of the alien kind of doing the strange mincing strut through the the sewer type area. Um, well, that's from a that's from an area that could actually have been relatively scary. You're, you're down. It's it's contrived a way to take all your weapons off you, and, and you're like pretty much alone. There's no annoying squad mates with you at that point, and you're in this yeah this sort of dank dark area um, and for whatever plot convoluted reason there's a bunch of alien husks down there most of which are dead but some of which will move and, uh, and are kind of attracted to sound and stuff like that and, and that could have been a pretty good sequence you know I'm sort of thinking like uh, Jurassic Park or something how the T-Rex if you stand perfectly still uh, allegedly <laughs> won't eat you um, and I think that was the kind of thing they were going for there but it's just ruined because the animation if you've seen that uh, little clip or, or videos of it. It's just hopeless. It's hilarious. They're doing this ridiculous, <laughs> ridiculous kind of I'm holding in a poo constipated walk, uh, <laughs> waddling through the area. Um, yeah, it's like, well, well uh, any any tension that there was here is, is just dissipated immediately. Um, 
anyway, I've, I've kind of covered a lot of this in the review, really, and about my, how the characters are paper thin, etc., etc. My 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 favorite thing about Aliens Colonial Marines, listeners, go onto YouTube now and type in Aliens Colonial Marines all singing, all dancing. Um, <laughs> That that is one of the finest things I've seen in a long time. It is it, it almost makes the game worthwhile unless you paid for it, in which case it's probably of little solace. Um, I, I think there's probably two ways you can actually make a, a good Aliens game. One of them is, as Paul said, to make it really, really hard. Um, kind of like what the earlier Aliens 3 games were like, if I remember rightly. Uh, or more recently, Aliens Infestation on the Nintendo DS, which uh, gave you a grand total of 19 marines, all of whom had their own personality and dialogue and so on. And uh, if one of them died, they were dead. They were gone for good. You would never see them again. Uh, which kind of lent, as you mentioned, some tension and urgency to it. And it was also really hard. Um, the other way to do it, I think, is to go entirely the opposite direction and make a newt simulator. Um, something more akin to amnesia or clock tower where you are essentially trying to hide and get from A to B uh, and not get caught by the aliens more than anything else. Um, which I think is kind of the other way to do it and build up the tension and make them terrifying, unstoppable death machines. Um, unfortunately, yep. this yep. sounds like it's it's just shit. Have you, um, have, you, have you been playing it, Tim? No, I haven't. Okay, okay, lucky you. Okay. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> back, um, back to the I, poor I, bastard that did. <laughs> I, I, I think Alien vs. Predator, the original, because I was not a fan of any of the sequels, really. Um, but the original kind of worked because it was really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And it also had some, some decent set pieces, some interesting mechanics, but that was the main thing. You were a Marine, but you were completely alone. There were lots of aliens, and they could kill you in seconds. Uh, ammo was fairly scarce and uh, yeah it was it was just hard and tense and focused very much on survival um, I, th I, think that, I think that first that first AVP game did the System Shock 2 uh, trick of uh, respawning enemies occasionally as well so that you were there were some places where you were kind of trapped indefinitely if you didn't like try and move on you couldn't just try and slog your way through uh, go on Paul I just want to say, because there's a comment on the, your review, actually, Peter, today, <laughs> some, poor, some poor guy says, this is the first ever game that I've pre-ordered. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought, oh, you know what? You know yeah. what? You poor man. Or well, woman. you should, what, what, some advice to some people is you should read the reviews on inkgamers.com. They're not <laughs> always out there day one, but at least we're going to give you an honest opinion of whether something's crap or not. So um, you could have saved yeah. yourself some money there. Sorry, mate. I mean, this does this this does raise obviously that raises some issues, and I, I touched on that in the review. That um, I mean, I, I think that the games journalism industry, for all that it gets a lot of flack, I think it did its job this time. It it gave this game the scores it deserved, except for one outlier from EGM that gave it like a nine for some reason, but whatever. Uh, most people kind of saw this for what it was, um, but of course the problem is everyone was under embargo, or like us, they got the code late. So you know the pre-orders have already gone through. Um, you, you might get a refund if uh, circumstances allow you to do that, but it's it's not a good situation, is it, Paul? Yeah, there's actually, and um, this goes back to sort of preview events as well, because obviously the stuff that was shown for this at preview yeah. events was, was very different. I mean, it looks like a completely different game. Um, it's actually a good article today on um, Game of Sutra. I, I, I can't remember the uh, URL of it, because that would be too long to remember anyway. But basically <laughs> discussing the merits of preview events and how journalists really don't get any time and they're just PR-fed lines. And when people are asked any probing questions about the game they they go straight back on to the track that they've been told to stick on so preview events you know in, in themselves can be as damaging um, as far as raising the hype's concern for a game um, I think Alien Colonial Marine is, is a good example of that but this particular article that um, today was talking about Destiny and, and how effectively mm. um, people were sort of ferried in and you know they they were trying to find out more and trying to get some questions um, and there was just nothing forthcoming so to me they're just such a damn waste of time because you're not if you have to relay that information back to the reader and you don't have yeah. all the full information then effectively it's really not worth um, the sort of screen it's written on um, 
I don't know if things are going to change. I, I know that we certainly cut back on preview events because of we, we were finding this um, sort of late last year that effectively, you know, mm -hmm. a 15 minute interview with someone isn't really going to get the stuff answered that you want answered. And most of the hands on stuff you see isn't what you're going to see anyway, um, probably in the final game. So, yeah, it, it's good that you should look it up. I, I really wish I could remember the URL, but it, it was very good. Well, we'll yeah, link it in the uh, podcast blurb. Yeah, we, we maybe could could link it in the in the summary. Um, yeah, and you're in a tough situation as as a journalist at those sorts of events because yeah, your your main duty is to your readers to uh, relay what you've seen there and, and what you've played. If you're lucky enough to actually have played something, one of these things. Um, but at the same time, you do sometimes want to give some benefit of the doubt. I mean, if it's a game that's a long way out from release and, and they're saying, oh well, you know, we'll fix that, we'll will alter that, then you kind of want to think, yeah, they, they probably will. Um, I mean, I, I, I if know it's from a game that's about a month from release, maybe not. I know, I know from our point of view, I mean, I'd much rather that we all sat down and played a game in our own time um, and at our own yeah. speed mm -hmm. to try and get an understanding of the game before we write anything. And I think to try and do that on an embargo, usually from a preview event, we may draw a couple of days after the event finishes, then effectively you mm. can't really do a, a great job on it. And you really do need to spend a decent amount of time to do a decent preview. Um, and I just think the events themselves can be uh, more damaging um, than, than they're supposed to be. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, previews are very, very tricky things because, as Peter touched on, you're playing what is early code and it is completely unfair to give it a complete kicking for not having perfectly polished animations and so on because depending on how early it is, it probably won't have perfectly polished animations and so on. Um, but on the other hand, you're taking a lot on faith that all of this stuff is going to be ironed out by release. I mean, most of what you can take from a preview, more than anything, tends to be things like tone. Uh, rather than specifics about gameplay and so on, simply because so much is subject to so much change. Um, on the other hand, I don't think there's anything wrong with writing a negative preview. Um, I know a oh. few developers have, have actually come out and said that they quite like reading negative previews, uh, because if they're early enough on, then it gives them useful feedback they can actually use to fix things that journalists aren't so keen on. So, so, sadly, more often than not, that, that doesn't work out like that, though. And it's, and it, it's yeah generally all the stuff that they're trying to throw at you when you go to these events, whether it's like, swag or whatever it is, you know, um, they want you to like it, um, and that's I, the PR person's job. I, I kind of think that's that's divergent interests. The developers are probably more interested, some of them at least, are more interested in making a decent polished game, uh, and if yeah. there are these problems, they want to know about them so they can fix them. The publishers, on the other hand, and PR are much more interested mm -hmm. in getting positive feedback to get people hyped up about it. Um, which is kind of a delicate balance and one that we as journalists shouldn't really have any part in quite frankly if, if we like what we see then write that if we don't and it's got clear flaws in the basic design then write that uh, or just don't buy into the whole preview machine and uh, when you read a preview take it with a, a grain of salt read between the lines and as I say look more at what it says about the tone rather than the specific mechanics I think we've totally hijacked your <laughs> Totally hijacked your uh, no, no. It's, a good, here for you. it's a good. It's a good diversion. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that there's different. I mean, that's the, the previews based on uh, based on the events, which are very stage managed. You also get previews where um, you're just provided with the code. Um, you know, the, we, there's there's plenty of those that people do where the developers have just sent code over, and you you get to spend as long as you want with it. And they those by by and large are, are completely fine. Um, you know, because often you're in a beta or something with other people as well so you know others are getting a look at it too um, it's, it's the ones where it's kind of stage managed and I think this is why the uh, you mentioned tone and, and atmosphere and stuff too. I think this is why the gameplay demo that they showed uh, was particularly despicable because it it was pretty reasonable in, in tone and atmosphere um, unfortunately and, uh, it was completely uh, fictional right exactly I mean I don't know who Whoever kind of gave the okay for that should probably not still have a job. I don't think it's unreasonable to say that because it was pretty, pretty disgraceful, really. How long ago was that preview? I mean, I, I fully agree. Um, I, I just, I kind of have an inkling in mind that that was 
probably long enough ago that they thought that was where it was going to be at by now and that didn't materialise, um, which doesn't excuse things in any way, shape or form, but it does at least give a bit of a reason. And uh, had the game turned out to be like that, we probably wouldn't have complained so much about a purely fictional gameplay demo. Is, is it, um, is it um, our lowest score for a while? No, it's not. It's not. I gave Wazzy a 1. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> no, not brilliant. <laughs> well, you know what, you know what I mean. Yeah. I do, I do. Yeah, I mean, the, it, you know, it, it is a gameplay demo from a while ago, I think, a couple of years or something, but as, I think they were still using clips from that in promotional trailers and stuff, and I think I'm right in saying that Sega still have a trailer on their site that uses bits from that demo to advertise this game, so I mean, you can't, you can't really be doing that. Um, sure. There's obviously, been a, there's obviously been a lot of development troubles behind the scenes with this one because I mean it's been sort of in and out of production for about six or seven years, and I, and I kind of feel for anyone who's been having to do the grunt work on this. Like if it was outsourced to TimeGate and, and they were given like six months to do something on it or whatever, some poor programmer who's had to slog this in. You know, I hate the game, but like if you had to go through hell to get it out the door, then I don't blame you whatsoever. You know. I, I, uh, I do I do feel sorry for the uh, the people who are on the workforce of that. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's kind of one of those ones where I think everybody shares in some of the blame, or everyone who is managing the project shares in some of the blame. Mm. Um, both Sega and Gearbox, and probably people at TimeGate as well, uh, and whoever else was working on it. It's it's not one where I can really point at one person and say it's all your fault, because it it does kind of look like everyone fucked this one up. But yeah, I, I do feel sorry for the people who had to sit there coding and uh, doing the animations and so on, and probably realising that the game was going to get massively slagged off and loathed, uh, as the internet is quick to judge. On the other hand, I pointed this out to you a few times, uh, I think that Sega were basically screwed with this anyway. If they didn't release it, then you would probably be getting all sorts of quotes from Gearbox within the next 6 to 12 months saying, oh, it was, it was pretty much finished. Um, you know, it was a really good game, but Sega canned it. Uh, well, on the other hand, if they do release it, then they get slammed for trying to steal money from people. Um, they were kind of in a bit of a no-win situation unless they delayed it yet again and sank more money into it. Um, and they'd done that so much, reportedly, uh, that I couldn't really see that happening again. There's been a bit of that with the, uh, the Obsidian Aliens-based RPG. I've seen a lot of kind of the, the rumour going around, or kind of the the uh, the incorrect information is like oh it was it was practically finished and then and then Sega canned it but actually I mean um, Josh Sawyer from Obsidian has said himself it was nowhere near finished and if you've watched some of the a um, little bit of gameplay as has come out this week I think if you watch that it clearly is not anywhere close to being finished so much as I would have loved to see Obsidian's RPG take on Aliens um, you know whatever that project was uh, cancelled for it certainly wasn't like about to be released, I, I don't think. Um, so yeah, uh, is that enough about aliens killing your marines? Yeah, more I than feel likely. Like <laughs> and games journalism, and the preview culture, and uh, <laughs> just about everything else we can touch on tangentially. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. It is a problem though. Um, yeah. It, uh, who wants to go next? Who else has been playing some games? <laughs> uh, Tim. Tim, better go. Uh, okay, I'll see you later then. No, no, Tim. <laughs> what have you been playing, Tim? I know you uh, played a space-based horror game that was a bit disappointing, but in no way near as disappointing as Alien. Yeah, uh, I've, I've been playing Dead Space 3, which isn't a bad game. Um, it's, it's just not a particularly good one. Um, it kind of dropped all uh, the horror and tension and fear that the previous games had and swapped out for balls-to-the-wall action, or uh, most of the game did, anyway. And the action's fine and quite enjoyable, but it just sort of doesn't really mesh all that well. Um, and it's lost a lot. I'm using these words a lot uh, this week. It lost a lot in terms of tone and atmosphere. And um, yeah, that, that kind of didn't do it many favours, particularly as it's fairly long as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's okay. It's, it's just not scary at all, which is a bit of a problem. Um, Dead Space was quite a scary game, it had quite a lot of tension um, because you weren't quite sure what was going on, that was sort of tension of the unknown 
Uh, Dead Space 2 had lots of horrible things happening, um, including a rather infamous sequence involving needles and eyes, as Peter's indicating for uh. us there. Um, and yeah, Dead Space 3 just has you start off going around derelict spaceships and then going on to uh, an ice planet um, where aliens stop jumping out of the walls and vents and start jumping out of the snow. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I should say necromorphs, not aliens. Um, and it's That sounds quite Christmassy. <laughs> it's not that out Christmassy. <laughs> Although I would like to see a mod which, which adds <laughs> Santa hats to everything. Maybe throws a few Christmas trees around. You can have baubles hanging off the horrific mass of tentacles. Um, it's it's okay if you've if you liked past Dead Space games. It's probably worth a play anyway, and you've probably already bought it. Um, although possibly not until it's a little bit cheaper. If you haven't played other Dead Space games, you'll probably enjoy this more because you'll have no expectations. Um, yeah, it's it's okay. I actually kept a tally of uh, how many times. I, it made me jump or made me scared or fearful to walk into the next room. Hmm. Um, it, it, the, the number of times it made me fearful was exactly zero. Um, and the number of times it made me jump was, I think, around about four or five, which isn't much for something that took me about 11 or 12 hours. Um, for a horror game, or for something that is marketed as a horror game, that's not particularly good. Um, and most of those were very, very cheap scares, as in there is absolutely nothing around, and then you open a door, and oh god, there's something giant right there. Um, just little things like that, it's, eh, it's, it's okay. It still does some of the Dead Space stuff really well, though. The zero gravity stuff is nice. Um, there's some really good attention to detail in the, in the environments. They're still very, very pretty, particularly out in space. Um, yeah, there, there are some really nice touches to it. It's, it's just... It's all right. It's it's a it's a bit more than a shrug, but not much more. Um, yeah, you'll probably quite enjoy it. Go play it. Have have a degree of fun. Just maybe wait until it's a bit cheaper because thirty five quid seems a bit too much for it. Any questions? No, um, I, I don't really. Sorry, I haven't played any of the Dead Spaces, so I can't really ask anything. Um, Anything insightful, I'm afraid. Um, first, the first was the best. It, it kind of had System Shock 2 elements to some extent, uh, although it's nowhere near as good as System Shock 2, because System Shock 2 is brilliant. Um, although saying something isn't as good as System Shock 2, is that's quite a high bar to set for anything. Yeah, it's, it's not unreasonable for a game to be worse than System Shock 2 and still be yeah. a really good game. Um, I, I know you've both... Uh, Paul, I'm going to bring you in here. You've both been playing uh, a bit of Empire. Is this yeah, correct? I, I, I slung about an hour and a half into it on um, Sunday night. Um, yeah. Oh no, I'm torn on this one. <laughs> and Tim's probably torn on this one either. Okay, it's not Dungeon Keeper before that. It's no, it's there. not Dungeon Keeper. It's, it's not it's Dungeon it's Keeper. But, like it. Um, I, actually, the thing that really pissed me off, and actually, I've seen a lot of people come in. This is the bloody mouse scrolling. It doesn't function properly, um, and it's got to be a bug. It's got to be fixed. Um, usual Dave. thing, though, with a lot of paradox games, unfortunately, that they tend to come out riddled with bugs, um, and that really annoyed me. Go on, Tim. They actually said that that was entirely intentional, uh, and uh, they planned. They actually, uh, at one point, they had no mouse scrolling in the game at all. Uh, um, I didn't find that too much of an issue. It was kind of weird at first because I thought that. It was kind of locking me for the tutorial section, yeah, and then I realised it wasn't. Um, once I actually got used to using WASD or the arrow keys, it was it was all right. It doesn't bother me that much. Um, I don't. I just. I don't know. I just find that um, I don't know, the UI just seemed a bit overcomplicated. Um, did you not find that, Tim? I just um, kind of find that a little bit I've, irritating. I've I've played for about seven hours at this point I think um, which is a fairly good sign because I'm not as far as I know reviewing this um, and well, I do you, keep well, coming back to now. it you might be now oh Jesus um, <laughs> if you want let's, let's peer what's <laughs> I'm not it. going to no do we ruin yeah. the bridge um, the bridge is quite good for anyone wondering not talking about the bridge we talked about your game for 
hours. Sorry, <laughs> it's not my game. Don't, don't get, I'm not responsible for this. I yeah. you, there's, some, there's something about. about it, I don't know if you're thing. thinking about this, but when you play Dungeon Keeper, everything just seems so smooth and so fluid. You know, Dungeon and Keeper, this the, I don't get that. The the interface with Empire did seem a bit weird to start with. I've kind of gotten used to it now, so it doesn't really bother me. Um, didn't take me that long to click, but it's definitely not Dungeon Keeper. It, it no. looks like Dungeon Keeper. It smells like Dungeon Keeper. It's an RTS with a couple of RPG elements. Um, the the biggest difference, and the one that I'm seeing quite a lot, is that there is no ecosystem. Um, Dungeon Keeper and Evil Genius, which I've also been playing a bit of this week, um, they kind of worked because you didn't have direct control over most things. You could pick them up and put them down, and you could give vague orders, but for the most part, everything had a set of parameters and its own individual AI. They needed to do various things. With Empire, there is no such thing. Um, you have to manually tell everything to do everything. Mm. Um, uh, there's maybe, just so much micromanagement, and it really gets on my nerves. Maybe, with maybe, that, maybe that's what I mean by fluidity. Yeah, you know that it just kind of you did something, and it just kind of worked. Um, and I, I agree. I think that that I did find that a little bit irritating. But whereas I was probably expecting it not to be like that. Um, but it's not Dungeon Keeper. But I don't know. I think we should do an Ink Gamers plays on this anyway. We've all got we've all got codes. We should. All yeah, go. I think so. Um, I mean, the most the uh, the, the the most well, the multiplayer is in beta at the moment, apparently, which is kind of weird. But yeah, yeah. we should give that a look. Um, but no, the the most egregious thing is just that the little handholds it gives you uh, to make the. AI do things like you can set your squads or your individual monsters to patrol in which case they will just wander the corridors and they'll smash any heroes or any ladders they find um, but they won't eat for instance you have to manually tell them to go and eat and while they won't die if they don't eat it, it, their aggression bar gradually lowers unless you've picked up a specific upgrade um, and that dictates how much damage they do in combat uh, which means that unless you're going back and sending any patrolling minions to the kitchen to go and get some food regularly, they're going to be completely useless in a fight. Uh, at which point you might as well just stick them into a squad and uh, whenever a hero turns up, just teleport everything on top of it. Um, it it's not a game where you can leave things to their own devices. It is very, very hand-holdy. Uh, that doesn't sound like a very interesting design decision to me um, I mean if you I, I kind of feel like for um, I, I appreciate that they're going for a different type of game than Dungeon Keeper but I What's much a different prefer different type of game, I want Dungeon Keeper yeah I don't understand Like it happened with Realm Forge and Dungeons as well and now with this, it's like just, just copy Dungeon Keeper, <laughs> it's fine we don't mind, I won't give you a bad review for being derivative, I'll go oh great it's basically Dungeon Keeper 3 get in yeah, we, we haven't had Dungeon Keeper, I mean Evil Genius was what, 2004? and that wasn't yeah. great but you know it was quite like Dungeon Keeper and it was sort of James Bond 007's Dungeon Keeper um, and it had its flaws but it was decent uh, but no, this this isn't that, and it's a bit of a shame. Um, what, I, should, I just I, think, I, I, I sorry, just think what, is in, what is interesting about having to monitor your creature's hunger level and send them back to the kitchen periodically, isn't it more interesting to go, oh, okay, I've got these creatures that need to eat sometimes, I need to put some uh, kitchens down somewhere, mm. I'll put them in a good place so that they're always pretty near a kitchen, and they'll go there on their own when their hunger stats peaks or yeah, whatever. That, that's, that's strategic, that's sort of interesting, and then you can see it happening. And, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's not that. You don't, for instance, your creatures don't need to sleep, so you don't need to build a barracks or a sleeping area. Um, uh, the only thing you can actually construct on your own terms are corridors, uh, and most rooms will have multiple entrances, so you can kind of link up your dungeon, but rooms are always the exact same size, they look exactly the same. Uh, they are like buildings in an RTS, basically. It's an RTS, only it's underground. Yeah, uh, that sounds, it's, that sounds so boring. That sentence, though, just makes it sound so boring. The only thing you can construct is corridors. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, you've, you've got traps and so on as well. Some of which are more useful. Yeah, yeah. It it kind of it sort of hits the right notes. I mean, I've. It sounds weird, but I've only played it for about seven hours, uh, and I think I'm only about five or six missions in, uh, so it's probably fairly lengthy at least. 
I do keep going back to it, which is the weird thing. Um, there's so much that it just seems like it gets wrong, but there is something more-ish about it. Yeah, I must, I must admit, I, I kind of feel that way as well, Tim, about it. Um, I really need to sink more time into it, and I think we should probably have a look at it in the multiplayer uh, yeah, probably yeah. at the end of the week. Um, it, it is... It is fairly entertaining. I mean, it, it looks quite nice. The animations are, are pretty good. The voice acting is not superb, but it's it's not bad. The writings, again, it's it's all right. And um, there's there's quite a lot that's all right about it. Mm. Kind of, if you can get over the fact that it's not Dungeon Keeper, it doesn't appear to be a bad game. It just appears to be one with some really questionable design decisions. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I wasn't expecting it to be um, like Dungeon Keeper. I wasn't actually expecting that at all. I just because want it's... Dungeon Keeper. Yeah, I know, but you can't have it, Tim. <laughs> That's why can... I went. Unless you go right to... God. You only do... It'll only happen if you go right to Peter Molyneux's house with a bag of, <laughs> of turtlenecks, and that he may do it for you then, but it's Please, not Peter happen. Molyneux, make another Dungeon Keeper. He probably can't. Uh, who owns the uh, IC? Yeah. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, yeah he's he's not not Oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll get Dungeon Keeper, the first-person shooter with Space Marines before long. Oh, uh, well, so, don't mention Space I mean, this, Marines. This, this is why I, I went back. I, I wanted to remind myself what this was like. I, I could have gone, because I've got both Dungeon Keeper games on GOG, but I went and played Evil Genius instead, um, because that was slightly less well-received. Um, and even that, it, it just feels so fresh and innovative right now, because there's been nothing like it for years. Uh, it really needs a time skip function. But other than that, it's it's a fun game where you build an underground uh, supervillain base and you try and take the world hostage, and it's it's really neat. And then you kind of you you wonder why no one else has done anything like this in so long. I would imagine it's really difficult to do because like balancing I'm... an ecosystem is a tricky thing to get right. Yeah, correct, correct uh, me if I'm wrong, Tim. But actually, when that was released, I don't think it actually sold very well. Um, yeah, in fact, I think. I... Um, I actually met the chap who who was behind it um, before it was released, and uh, talk, talk, talk really talked it up. But when it came out, I just think people just didn't get it, and it just didn't sell very well at all. You you're probably right, and it's a bit of a shame. Um, I would if if Evil Genius Two came up on Kickstarter or something like that, then I I would absolutely shell in a bit of money for that. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my takeaway for the moment is hold off on Empire for the moment until we've had a proper look. Um, but you, you should totally go onto GOG or Steam and go and buy System Shock 2 and the Dungeon Keeper games and possibly Evil Genius as well if you fancy something a little bit different. Maybe if you've watched Skyfall. Um, speaking of Skyfall... No, no, <laughs> Wait no, a minute. no, 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 no Skyfall. But it, it's really funny how we always tend to go back every week, we always start um, talking about retro stuff. Yeah. And and that just shows you, you know, there is a problem right now with stuff that's innovative, exciting. The problem is the problem is that we're all old. That's well, the problem. <laughs> yeah, we are all old farts, but um, well, Tim's not old for Christ's sake. Tim's about twelve. I've got he's, white he's, hair, dude. He's, he's about twelve. He's got a child's bedroom for God's sake. <laughs> white hair. Well, Tim, can you show everyone your sweeties this week? Uh, I've eaten them. But yeah, I, I, I oh, had Smarties. Oh, yeah. Mummy gave him some Smarties before the show. Uh, bought my <laughs> Smarties fiber bar thing that I'm going to have later. <laughs> there is, I'm, I am astonished though at, at how there are, if you go back 20 years or 25 years, there are so many games that simply wouldn't get made now. And these were made by one person in their bedroom. Things like Midwinter, where you basically ran a first person guerrilla warfare campaign uh, and it was completely open world and completely free form. That was 1988 uh, and nobody's done anything like it since or Dungeon Keeper which is kind of a fully self-contained ecosystem. Um, yeah. you, you don't see these things so much these days um, possibly because people don't think they'll sell, possibly because they're an awful lot of work and they do require a very singular vision which is difficult to do in big studios. Um, and I will admit that if you're going back and looking at 25 years and cherry-picking one or two things, then there's probably equally one or two things you can pick from the last 10 years that are fairly innovative and wonderful. But it's still a shame to see ideas like this not turning up anymore. Mm. Do you think we've mentioned GOG enough to get some advertising from them? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure we have. 
Paul, Paul will have a big GOG poster behind him next week. Uh, actually, I don't think any of the games you've got on those posters are on GOG. No, prob it, probably not. I think they're oh. trying to sing out with LucasArts, so we might see X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter on oh, there. Like actually, that should just be remade, anyway. Yeah. Versus time. Mm -hmm. To be honest, yeah, I don't really care if I, 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 X Wing and Tie Fighter and X Wing versus Tie Fighter. I don't really care if they were remade in HD to look pretty. I just like a version of them that works on modern systems. They weren't really games that were heavily focused on graphics because you were mostly looking at black. Yeah, oh, but but it would be nice though, wouldn't it? Lots of nebulas and stuff. Sorry. Getting carried away here. We're just drowning in a nostalgia vortex hello, here. Hello, hello. <laughs> Dragging out the Look podcast for sort of an hour and a half in length. Rap. Or I, I missed what you said, Tim. Wrap up. Oh, wrap up. Okay. Yeah, wrap up. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm pleased because every time mentioning Facebook seems to be having an effect because we've actually got a few more Facebook likes uh, since we started doing that. I don't know are if we, that's related to. Are we up to 10 yet? Yeah, ten, um, ten, 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 and and uh, nine of those are your mum. We've probably had about <laughs> ten in the last couple of weeks, but that's not bad for us. So, so yeah, do that. Go to Facebook, like us, um, follow, follow. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll see some interesting posts about Gearbox and aliens, <laughs> colonial marines. Um, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> I might have to go back to Twitter at some time, sometime soon, if only because my last few tweets I think I was threatening to set the Isle of Man on fire, uh, and I should probably push them a bit further into yeah, my Yeah, you history. should probably watch that, Tim, because <laughs> next time you're at the airport you'll be arrested. Get terrorists. Yeah. Yeah. That wouldn't be good. We don't, we don't want to lose you from the podcast, Tim. The, the staff is uh, thin enough as it is at this place. <laughs> can't, can't be another man down. Uh, anyway, yes, let's uh, let's wrap it up by saying uh, we'll be back next Wednesday with another podcast, and uh, we're, in which we'll probably be rambling on about more retro games again. What and have we got off before you go? Because I'll interrupt you as usual. What have we got coming up awesome. this week? Uh, what do we have oh, no. coming up? Um, I've previewed a uh, uh, 4X strategy game called Star Drive. Um, that wasn't a preview event. I, I just received the, the beta code, so I got a good few hours with that. Um, so. I, Give my thoughts on that. That'll probably be up, I'm sure. Um, Colonial Marines review is up, obviously. This podcast will be up. Um, okay. I guess, yeah, we'll do an Ink Gamers plays of, of Empire at uh, some point. Um, also, I also... Yeah, we, I just want, got, to, I want to say as well that um, there's a new site on the network, which is um, poe.ingamers.com for all Path of Exile um, uh, fans. Do check yeah. it out. Contribute. Share your builds. Talk to us. Make comments. And just join the community. So it's poe.inkgamers.com. You go for all your path of exile needs. Uh, I'm yeah. I'm going to finish wrapping up now and just say goodbye. Goodbye. That was sudden. I know. Game over, man. Game over, man. Game over. <laughs>